They say you reap what you sow. Each body's gonna have to wait. Let's get started. Well, hey there, welcome to Emmanuel. My name is Eric Ness, and I just want to say I am so glad that you joined us today. And if this is your first time, I just want to extend a special like, hey there to you, because it is so cool that you decided to join us today. And we would love to get connected with you, and the best way to do that is by filling out our digital connect card, which is just in the comment section. And don't worry, it won't take a while, it'll just take a few minutes, and that way our team can reach out to you this week. Well today, Josh finishes our sermon series called Own It. And he talks about how we should stop making excuses and start owning our responsibilities. But first we're gonna sing a song. This song is called Worthy. And the chorus goes like this. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. God is so worthy of our praise. He is so worthy for us to honor him and sing to him. And so I just encourage you in your house to sing along or at least just focus on the words of this next song. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life
Hey Emmanuel family, I'm here at a safe place in Zion and I'm really excited to drop off a check that's going to help them so much and it's because of your generosity in the month of May. So I'll see you inside. So I'm here with my friend Amaris. She is the chief development, development <laughs> officer for Safe Place and they are doing incredible work. So say hi to Amaris. Thanks so much for letting us stop by. Can you tell us just a little bit about what Safe Place does and even, even some about the added stress that's gone on during COVID. Thank you so much for being here and for giving us this opportunity. For sure. One, uh, for for coming and, and wanting to know about what we do and how the COVID-19 has impacted our, our clients. Uh, we are the, the sole provider of services to victims of domestic violence and human trafficking in Lake County. Um, in a given year, we can serve up to 30,000 individuals, um, wow. and most of them uh, from Lake County. We have about 14 different satellite offices um, where we provide services uh, to clients for counseling, support groups, emergency shelter, housing, permanent housing, transitional housing, um, legal advocacy for orders of protection and the list goes on and on training mm -hmm. and education um just or any service around uh helping somebody a survivor a victim of domestic violence or human trafficking mm -hmm. um and with this pandemic what we have seen is a huge increase in need um we have gone from having 14 calls emergency calls on our hotline a week to having over 100 calls in one week sheltering on average about 30 individuals in our emergency shelter to having to shelter over 90 clients in, in scattered wow. sites, uh, emergency sites, due to an imminent danger to their, to their safety. So we definitely have seen an increase since, since the middle of March. Um, and we want to get the word out that our services have continued. Yeah. Even though we, I always say my, my thing is, um, domestic violence does not stop for COVID-19, hmm. right? We, hmm. we got placed a, a stay at home order that just increased our numbers because now you have the person who's abusing and the victim in the same household longer periods of time. Um, maybe uh, the support system is cut off from our survivors and our victims, right? Because they're not yeah. going to work. They're not getting together with family. So we definitely have seen that that stay in place has affected our clients and the need that our clients have wow. but our staff has really worked super hard to make sure that services are are not interrupted that we continue to provide the quality service that we can for everybody in the time that's amazing and the matter we are so privileged our church has been so generous so in may uh, we committed 5% of every dollar that was given to our church would go back out to our local partners and organizations that are doing incredible work, just like you and the good people here at Safe Place. So this is a check for $2,500. Wow. And we hope that that is a help to you as you guys continue to do that amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I get goosebumps because I always said when I came to work for a Safe Place, the generosity of our community and the support that we get from the community is what continues mm. to make this agency work mm. um, and continue to provide the services that the community needs. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, our pleasure, our pleasure. Thank you so much. And thanks, Emmanuel, for your generosity this month. We love you and we're doing great things in the community. We'll see you soon. Well, I just love being a part of this Emmanuel family and seeing how your generosity can impact this community. And in case you didn't know this, for the month of May, Emmanuel Church decided they were gonna give 5% of all the gifts received back to our community. And so that was just a glimpse of how your generosity has helped the community during these tough times. If you're interested in, in partnering with us to help people know Jesus and grow to be like him, all you have to do is click the link in the comment section. I just wanna say thank you so much for your generosity as one of the youth pastors here seeing myself and being able to connect with students continually through these tough times it has been incredible and all of that has been made possible through your generosity and so i just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to my emmanuel family
A couple years ago, I took a good long look in the mirror, horrified at what I saw. Then I looked again and again and again and again and nothing was changing. The fact that I didn't like it and the fact that I wanted something to be different didn't make anything different. For most of my life, I wanted to be able to watch a lot of Netflix and eat a lot of chips and I'd still somehow end up looking like Thor from the Avengers. I know, it sounds crazy, but that's how I operated. And maybe you have too. I didn't want to change anything. I, I didn't want to believe that in order to be different, I'd have to do different. Eventually I wised up though, and I began a long, difficult journey. And I'm a little proud to say that over the last two years, I've lost 50 pounds. The key word there is two years. I decided I wanted to do it in a sustainable way. No yo-yoing. So I didn't do the fad diets and I didn't do the crazy workout videos. I just moved more and ate less. And eventually I've been able to reach my goals. But I couldn't just sit there anymore. I couldn't just hope it was going to be different. I was going to have to own it. I was going to have to own that this was my body. Those were my pounds. And whatever I was going to do about it was my responsibility. I was going to have to move. And it required a few tweaks and maybe even a few additions to my toolbox in life. And I'd like to introduce you to a few of them this morning. Um, one was my scale. I decided that I needed to have a way to measure success. And I knew what I couldn't do was measure my success based on other people's measurements. Because I was not gonna be 6% body fat in a 205 pound muscle built guy in no time. So for me to compare myself to like Dwayne The Rock Johnson was foolishness. I was gonna need to compare who I was today up against who I was yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. And hopefully tomorrow would be even better. But I had to pick a metric and a measure that I was gonna go by. And it, it really couldn't be by anybody else. The other thing that I had to just understand was it was gonna require a lot of time in these. I was gonna have to run. I was gonna have to walk. I was gonna have to exercise. I was gonna have to put something into it. The process and the change and all of those kinds of things, right? I, I couldn't just sit there and hope and wish and pray. I needed to get up and move. I was gonna have to invest something. One of the investments for me was here. This is my phone, but it's also my calendar. I don't do the paper thing anymore. So I would actually put appointments with myself to exercise on my calendar so that when I looked at my agenda for the day, it said run or it said lift or it said walk or whatever the case was for that day. And I wouldn't put anything over the top of it. Now, sometimes that meant I was going to run late at night or have to get up early in the morning and do it. But I was going to need to make sure that I had a way to consistently show up to what I needed to do. If I just left it to when I felt like it or when it was convenient, it would never, ever get done. And I think some of what I've been learning over the last two years not only applies to my life physically, but relationally, professionally, and even spiritually. I do believe that when it comes to every facet of our lives, we need to own it in such a way that we put into what it is that we've been given or what it is that we want to be true. And as difficult as this is to hear, and again, you, you may want to shut me off when this is over. Please don't. Um, but spiritually isn't a joke. It, we're, that's going to be a part of this for us. The idea of measuring how are we improving and thinking about those things, the idea of investing and putting in time and energy and effort, the idea of showing up regularly and consistently over time, that's all part of the deal. You could think of it in three simple words. I don't usually do like three-point message kinds of things, 
But today I'm going to give you three words to remember that I hope you'll take with you from here. One, gauge. Two, give. And three, grind. Those are three ingredients that have to be present whenever we're going to own it. And today we're going to talk about primarily owning our spiritual lives, but I believe this applies to, again, our professional life, our relational life, our personal life, all the alls in our life. I think that if we are willing to gauge, give, and grind in it, we are going to do something with it. We're going to see change, and we're going to see a difference, and we're going to feel a sense of satisfaction. So I want to show you a small piece of a letter that a guy named Paul wrote way back in the first century. And he wrote it to a bunch of Christians or Jesus followers in an area of his world called Galatia. And what I hope you're going to hear in this are some things that apply to you and I even today. I think that's what's most amazing about the scriptures and particularly these letters that were written so long ago is that they still apply to us today even though there's such a gap of time between them. So here's what Paul says in what we call chapter six of that letter. Just a few sentences. He says, if you think you're too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. Nobody else is buying it. You're not pulling it over on anybody. So if if you've bought into that you're above it all, you need to buy something else. He says, you're not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. Don't pay attention to their work. Don't pay attention to your neighbor's work. Don't pay attention to what the Instagram celebrity is doing. You pay attention to you, because you you will only experience the satisfaction of a job well done, Paul says, is is when you only get that when you look at your own work and what's been given to you and what you are responsible for, what you've been called to own. He, He wraps it up and he says, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. So this is why I use the word gauge. Paul spends a a very focused amount of time helping us understand you are not a correct gauge. You're going to measure yourself wonky. (laughs) It's not going to be tuned or timed right. So be careful with that. It's so easy to buy into self-importance. It's also easy to buy into others' obsession and look at what they're doing and always believe that we're never going to measure up. I don't know if you've experienced this in your life, But I can always find somebody that's doing whatever I'm doing better than I'm doing it. And this could not be more true than the season in which we're living right now. Everybody that does what I do is online doing it now. So I can watch them and I can compare and I can constantly feel like I'm not doing it as well as them. But Paul says don't do that. But also don't think you're so important that you can't help somebody else. Don't think you're so important that you can't do something. You haven't arrived. You're not there. For me, what Paul's pointing at is the difference between living life staring in the mirror and living life looking out a window, neither of which are ideal. Because when we look in the mirror, it's all about us, right? And we can start to believe that we're too important to help somebody to stoop down or to do anything about the things in our life that we don't like, right? We, we, it just is what it is. That's the phrase that we'll attach to it often. And we can stall out and we can get stuck there. Self-important, right? My position at my work is too big a deal. My accomplishments are too much. Or I believe that the world orbits around me. And we never wrestle with the idea that maybe I was just a big fish in a small pond. But then we start looking out the window, right? We start looking at what other people are doing, trying to keep up with the proverbial Joneses or our coworkers. It doesn't matter what your job is, right? You're always going to find that person. So whether you're a pastor and you're preaching online all the time now, or you are a business person and you're comparing your sales in this season to someone else's season, 
or in someone else's in this season, or you're a stay-at-home parent, even that, you can constantly be looking on social media going, I'm a terrible parent. I didn't throw the birthday parade. I didn't have some big Zoom extravaganza for my anniversary or whatever the case may be. Right? I don't know why you'd have a Zoom call for your anniversary. That's weird. Random thought. But we do it all the time. And Paul says, don't do that. You're missing out. If you're so important, self-important that you don't do anything or you're so obsessed with someone else that you believe you're never going to measure up, then you're going to always miss out. You're never going to find satisfaction. So here's my recommendation when it comes to gauging ourselves, whether that's professionally, relationally, spiritually, all the things we've already mentioned. Measure by videotape or video. I know we don't use tape anymore. But to me, this is different than staring in a mirror because what I'm looking at is just on the other side of it. But when you watch video back of yourself, there's a gap. You've moved on from that place and you're looking back in time to see how you've grown or changed since then. You've maybe been in this place where your mom or your dad pull out the old family videos. It usually happens when your new boyfriend or girlfriend or person that you've never introduced or told them about those parts of your life, right? They pull out the videos where you were a little kid. For me, I was so obnoxious. I was so like loud and get me, get me in the camera and everybody look at me and some would say that's not changed. (laughs) But you look at that and you go, oh, I don't want to be that way. I hope I'm not that way now right? It's different. And so for me, I I am always watching myself. I know that sounds a little self-absorbed and I'm just trying to be straight with you and honest with you about how I'm managing weird times right now. But right now, while this is showing up on your screen, whether you're watching it on TV or on your phone or your computer, I'm watching it live with you. I'm watching myself. I'm trying to get your head around that. And what I'm doing is I'm going, I don't like how I did that. I don't like what I did there. And I'm going to change that for next time because I'm working on my own craft. I'm working on how I do what I do. And for me, that's not the same as just assuming I've got it all figured out, which would be more the mirror. And it's not the same as watching someone else just kind of wanting to throw my hands up in the air because I'm never going to add up. It's just me comparing my now self to my then self and how have I improved. And what can I do to improve further from here? So take a look at how you were doing spiritually six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. And where are you today? And what steps could you take going forward? Apply that to any other area of your life. But make sure your gauge is the right kind of meter. Second thing, you got to give. Don't worry, this is not the part of the message that's about give money. It has nothing to do with money. Whatever it is that you want to be great and to change and to improve and to grow in your life, you're going to have to give something to it. This is true spiritually for us. When we're following Jesus, following is an action word. You're going to have to put your shoes on and start moving. We cannot sit on the couch and just expect good things to come our way. I can't will and hope and pray my way to it. I'm going to have to get up and do something about it because it's my name on the door to this life. Nobody else's. So I've got to show up. And I can't shortcut it. There's no life hack for this. Have you ever found one? If you have, let me know. But when it comes to Christianity or spirituality, there's no shortcut. There's no section on the Lifehack website that says, here's how you can short circuit being a Christian and you can arrive at, you know, the Paul level or Jesus level. You're you're not going to find that. This is a process. And this is what Paul points to next. He says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest and what you plant. Always. In other words, You're never going to pull out of the ground something other than what you put into the ground. You're not going to get some vegetable when you planted fruits. That is just not how things work. You can't mock the justice of God. You can't 
short circuit what he's put in place and how he's determined things are going to work. And for you and I to grow, we, we can't expect us to have fruit without putting in the work of planting and caring and fertilizing and growing it, right? That That is an ongoing thing. It's not a one and done. It's not a, hey, I... I think it's just going to happen for me sort of thing. We've got to show up consistently and put in the work. We're going to have to own the process too. Besides, quick fixes never work. It's why fad diets come and go. And it's why all the, there's, there's libraries full of exercise videos. I mean, I remember Tybo. Some of us remember videos where we had to put on Tights, well, I didn't put on tights, but tights and headbands and step up on a stair over and over again. You maybe have that one on your shelf, right? Like all of these things come and go. Quick fixes never work. In fact, they often lead to worse breakdowns later. I'll give you another example. Duct tape. Yeah, duct tape fixes everything for now. But eventually it falls apart again. And eventually it's just breaking on top of what's already broken. So it's worse off than when you started. Or go back to fitness, steroids. They will help you get your results quicker. But later, your body's going to be broke down and you're going to be sick. You can fake it on social media so that your life looks like the life of a celebrity who has a bunch of time and a bunch of money. But eventually it's going to catch up. And eventually you're going to feel worse than when you started off. Understand that you're going to have to show up and do it. You're not going to get closer to Jesus or closer to your goals without showing up and putting something into it. So every day, this is my goal. Every day I'm trying to find one thing that takes me closer to what I want to be true tomorrow. So I look at today and I ask myself, what's one thing? Because I can't handle more than one thing. What's one thing I can do today that moves me one step closer to where I want to be tomorrow? That's what it means to give to the process, to give to where you want to be. So if you want to grow spiritually, what do you need to do today? For some of us, it's we, we literally need to turn off our phone and get quiet and just be with God. For some of us, it's we need to spend some time in prayer. For some of us, it's we need to listen to some worship music. For some of us, it's we need to go for a long walk. If you want to improve your career, is there a book you can read, a podcast you can listen to? What can you give to it today? If you want to be a better parent, what's an activity you can do with your kids? What's something your kids have been dying to hear from your mouth that you could say to them today? There's always one thing. Give to what you want it to be. And when you do, grind it out. We so easily give up because we get tired. We so easily give up because we get bored. And we wonder why nothing ever changes. It's because we, we have a flash of effort at the beginning and then we fizzle. And Paul reminds us, you don't only not get what you don't plant, but if you're not willing to keep on it, you're going to fall short. This is what he says next. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Paul uses that word tired and the Hebrews would have understand it, understood it in terms of their belts. And I know that sounds weird, uh, but thinking in our day and age, we use the word slack, slackers or slacking off. It actually comes from the same kinds of principles. It was such an agricultural society, i.e. they use agricultural metaphors all the time. But when they talked about working or when they were getting ready to work, they would cinch up their belt. A lot like we would do today. You know, you're going to be bending over more and you're going to be moving in different directions and you want everything to hold up and hold together. So they would tighten up their belt and you knew they were done for the day when they'd let slack back into their belt and they would loosen it up. And so Paul, essentially what he's saying is, listen, tighten up your belt and don't loosen it. Don't put slack into it. You got to keep working. You got to keep chasing. You got to keep pursuing. Don't get tired of doing good. You've got to keep after it. The blessing will come when you don't give up. 
But if you give up, you miss out. When I was doing a very different job than the one I do today, every once in a while, I would have to change the shape of metal. And you would use a metal grinder to do that. It was kind of fun. You felt real tough and burly and everything, at least as tough and burly as I could ever feel. Because you take this, this electrical machine that has a wheel made out of stone or something like that, and it would spin incredibly fast. And then you apply it to the metal and sparks would fly and there'd be smoke and there would be a smell. But eventually you would grind down that metal and you could get it to the shape or the smoothness that you needed it to be. But I learned such an important lesson in that grinding. It requires consistent and redundant motion. Over and over again, the wheel spins in the same direction, a thousand or 2000 times a minute. And I have to apply it for minutes in order for any difference to be made. And why do we think our lives in any capacity are gonna be any different if we don't show up with consistent and redundant motion? That's the only way we're gonna change the shape of things. We're gonna have to grind it out. Don't give up before the job is done. Be consistent. And yes, it's like practice. You're gonna have to show up over and over and over again. So many people will say, well, I read my Bible today and it didn't mean anything to me. Read it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Even for me, there are times where I'll sit on my porch and I'll spend some time praying and I'll go, that didn't do a whole lot for me. And I give up and I need to show up over and over and over again, hourly, at least daily in that practice, grinding it out, doing good. You may not make a difference in your neighbor's life in one stop at their yard, but on the third, fourth, fifth stop, when you, when you give them the time of day and you say hello, or you ask how they're doing, or you show up to help them carry in their groceries, and I know we still got a social distance, so maybe one day down the road. But when you do that consistently over time, you start to change things. So here's the goofy little challenge I want to give you. And if you don't do it, I'm not going to check up on you. I live on this side of the glass. I, I don't know what you're actually doing. But these words of gauge, give, and grind have become very important to me. So what I did with my belt that I wear every day, I actually wrote those words on the inside. It, it just says gauge, give, grind. And I wonder if you might consider doing that. So that every day you put your belt on, you cinch it up. You go, I'm going to work today. I'm going to own this life that God has given me. I'm going to own these gifts and I'm going to own these talents and I'm going to, I'm going to own the place in this world that God has assigned me to and I'm going to make the most of it because nobody else is going to fill my spot. Nobody else is me. So I'm going to show up 100% to whatever task, whatever relationship, whatever thing God has given to me. And I'm going to do it better than I did the day before. Because I'm going to measure. I'm, I'm going to care about that. And I'm going to invest into it. And I'm going to grind it out. I'm going to show up every day. Here's a principle I want you to walk away with. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. So if you're frustrated with how your life is going, if you're frustrated with where you're at spiritually, listen, you got there because of actions or inactions in the days leading up to today. And I know that's really hard to hear, but I've been saying it to myself all week long. I was saying that to myself for two years straight. I weighed what I weighed and I looked how I looked and I felt how I felt because I ate too much and I moved too little. I needed to own that. And then I needed to own the process of improving. And as I've applied that to all the various aspects of my life, including my walk with Jesus, it's made all the difference because I'm taking ownership for it. Those three ingredients, gauge, give, grind. You introduce those you will begin to own your life and be responsible for your life, the one and only that God's given to you. 
Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for the words of Paul and how he reminds us that there's no shortcuts here in any part of our lives, but especially spiritually. And so for my friends that are watching this and they have stalled out or they've gotten bored or they've gotten tired or they've gotten fed up with Christians in the church and so they've maybe walked away from you, I just ask that you would impress on their heart and their mind, even right now, just tap them on the shoulder with maybe if they were willing to change the gauge, give a little something to it and grind it out, that there's something better than what their their historical experience might have been. And for those of us, Lord, that think we've arrived, show us we haven't. For those of us who think we're too good to help somebody else out or to take action in our own life, to plant right seeds, help us to plant the seeds that are going to grow to the harvest that we're hoping for, that you would want for us. Lord, we know that we're not made right with you by doing. but So we're not talking about that, God. We're just talking about being good stewards and responsible with the life that you've given us. Help us with that. We love you so much. Amen. Hey, we want to just encourage you as the week goes on with a couple things. So if you have our app, um, and you can find it on any platform, I'd love for you to get it if you don't. And if you do, make sure you turn on notifications because today we're going to push out a brand new wallpaper that encourages you to own it. And it's going to look like a name tag. And on that name tag, you're going to be able, we're going to show you how to do this. You're going to be able to actually write on that name tag and retake the picture to use as a wallpaper. On the thing that says own it, you're going to put the thing that you need to own. What's the thing that God has maybe impressed on you over the last month to really take ownership and responsibility for? And then keep that on your wallpaper, on your phone. You look at your phone like a hundred times a day, probably even more right now. And you might be surprised with how you can rewire your brain to start thinking about that more and being more focused on it. We're also going to push out just some helpful questions and verses and prayers to be praying over the course of the next five days. Because we don't want this to be over when we go to the next broadcast here. We want this to hang on with you in the days and weeks ahead. So make sure you've got the app. We're going to stay in touch with you. And make sure that you're following us on all things social media. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, bookmark our website, because we want to be doing this with you. We were not made to do life alone. So let's do it together and make sure you stay connected through social media. We're excited as summer comes, we've got some new things coming. So you're going to want to make sure you get notified of those right away. I look forward to seeing you next week. We're going to start a brand new series called Hello, God? and explore what it means when it feels like God's not close. So we'll see you next time. Same place, same time.